The Vienna tapes, and confidential informants, were the government's only evidence against, Larry Hoover, when he was awakened at Dixon Correctional Center, at 4 o'clock in the morning, on August 31, 1995, as other inmates slept. At his request, Hoover was moved to medium security level Dixon, which is about 100 miles from Chicago, out of minimum security Vienna, which is a six-hour drive away from the city, in October 1994. They told him to get dressed, because he was wanted, out front. At the warden's office, Hoover, was met by, three carloads of federal agents. They handcuffed him, put him in an unmarked car, and drove him to an airport to be flown to Chicago's Meggs Field. In Chicago, a federal judge told Hoover he was being indicted on drug conspiracy charges, which could bring a mandatory life sentence without parole. The indictment claims that, through the implementation of a one-day-a-week, drug distribution program, the Gangster Disciples, and Larry Hoover most importantly, made $100 million a year. The feds, came up with $100 million like this. They estimated the total GD count at, 30,000 members, and then, randomly, multiplied each of those members by, $3,300, which, is what the government estimated that, each member paid to the organization, in dues, and street taxes. Obviously, prosecutors pulled this crazy high number out of their, collective asses, to hype up the indictment of the GDs, but it wasn't all just a government conspiracy. Larry Hoover's own words and actions, are the reasons he was sent to ADX Florence, the Alcatraz of the Rockies. According to a Chicago Tribune article, originally published on February 13, 1996, the words of, imprisoned gangster disciple gang leader, Larry Hoover, dominated the testimony Monday, in the trial of eight reputed gang leaders, and associates. Sitting quietly in a federal district courtroom, the jurors, were fitted with headphones, and listened to hours of tape jail conversations among Hoover, and his minions. The tapes described, in Hoover's words, how he demanded the collection of, street taxes, a set amount of money dealers made, from the sale of drugs, on disciple-controlled territory. The conversations, were taped by authorities, who planted a transmitter on a visitor's badge, that they gave to unsuspecting gang leaders, who made the six-hour trip to the Vienna Correctional Center, in southern Illinois to meet with Hoover. I'm gone lay it down, all over the city, and whoever, selling weed, they gonna give me one day, of sale profits per week on weed. Whoever selling pills, one day a week on drugs, a transcript had Hoover, telling Adrian Brad, an alleged narcotics supplier, who, is awaiting trial with Hoover on drug conspiracy charges. I'm talking about, all over the whole town, not just in one area, Hoover said in the taped meeting. Hoover, estimated the tax would bring in an extra $200,000 to $300,000, a week. But according to an article published in the Christian Science Monitor, Adrian Brad, is the worst form of rat bastard, scurrying on this planet because, he's an unintentional snitch. An unintentional snitch is a person so stupid, that they snitch on themselves, and others, without even realizing it. Hoover, was the brother I never had, recalls Adrian Brad, who grew up with the gang leader on Chicago's south side. One thing was clear, if you didn't sell drugs for Larry one day a week, he would shut you down, right? Asked Assistant U.S. Attorney Ron Safer. Yes, that's what I understood, Brad replied. Across the courtroom, Hoover, who had appeared relaxed and even jovial at times during the seven-week-long trial, looked on, stone-faced. In Larry Hoover's 2001 appeal, the court found, the defense rested without presenting any testimony by Brad, and the prosecution began its rebuttal case. Brad then changed his mind and asked for an opportunity to testify. The district judge had the discretion to say that he had waited too long, but the judge elected to grant Brad's request. None of the other defendants objected. Soon they wished that they had, because Brad's testimony inculpated not only himself, he admitted being a drug dealer but claimed that he had quit the GD and usually operated independently, but also Hoover and other defendants, whom Brad depicted as drug lords. Brad, supported the prosecutor's claim that Hoover, initiated a program under which members of the Gangster Disciples would, donate, their profits from drug sales one day, each week, to supervisory levels of the gang. This program, known variously as, Nation Work, and One Day a Week, had been a bone of contention at trial. Other defendants contended that, references on the tapes dealt only with, working for community betterment one day a week. Brad supported the prosecution's view. Other defendants, then moved for a mistrial or a severance. The district judge denied both requests, and did not abuse his discretion in doing so.
If Brad had testified during the defense's case, there would have been no occasion for either a mistrial, or a severance. Adrian Brad, is an idiot. Put some pressure on that like button, and subscribe, if you agree that life is too short, to do life in prison, for imposing a street tax on, a moron like, Adrian Brad, while the feds are listening. William Edwards, better known as, Too Short, was a gangster disciple leader that ran drug operations in the Robert Taylor homes, with his homie, Johnny, Crusher Jackson. Larry Hoover, referred to them as, The Kids. On October 30, 1993, on the first day of recordings on the Vienna Tapes Too Short, and Larry Hoover, were heard discussing the One Day a Week program. On November 14, Too Short and Crusher visited Hoover, and the feds would later establish a drug conspiracy, when prosecutors pointed out on the tapes that Hoover asked, how much money, we, had made. After that visit, cops followed Too Short, pulled him over and took $6,489 from his van. He laid low for a couple weeks but then, on December 11, 1993, Too Short took the six-hour trip to see Larry Hoover. At some point, he went to the bathroom, took a piss, but, when he went to wash his hands, he noticed wires sticking out of his visitor's name tag. He took it off, pulled at the wires, and a tiny microphone popped out. Stunned, he returned to the visiting area, and approached the table where Larry Hoover, Johnny Crusher Jackson, and Adrian Brad, were sitting, but didn't take his seat, he just stood there. According to an interview, Too Short Did From Prison, by Robert D. Williams, Hoover asked, What you looking like you seen a ghost for boy? I didn't say nothing, just, toss the microphone on the table. Then, he tells us he knew the feds had been watching, and, listening. According to an article, originally published in, the Chicago Tribune, on May 24, 2000, a high-ranking gangster disciple leader, was convicted Tuesday, of playing a key role in the gang's multi-million dollar narcotics distribution. Johnny, Crusher Jackson, was among the 39 defendants indicted with gang leader Larry Hoover in 1995, but he spent four and a half years on the run, before he was arrested in January, working in a cheese factory in Wisconsin. Between 1991 and 1995, Jackson, a trusted confidant of Hoover's, visited Hoover 173 times in state prison, where he was serving time for a murder conviction, and still running the gang, according to prosecutors. During three of those visits, in November 1993, authorities hit a tiny transmitter in Jackson's visitor's badge, and taped his conversations with Hoover. Johnny Crusher Jackson, and William Too Short Edwards, were eventually released from prison under the First Step Act. In 2020, Crusher, took the unusual step of writing to a federal judge, to thank him for releasing him from prison. According to an article in the Chicago Sun-Times, published on October 5, 2020, Jackson, who was once in the inner circle of Gangster Disciples founder Larry Hoover, told U.S. District Judge Harry Linen Weber, he's making the most of his freedom. He said, he and his wife, have a construction business, a non-profit organization to help the underprivileged, and a clothing line. But, it appears Jackson hasn't completely turned his back on his past. The brand name for his sweatshirts and t-shirts, Gentlemen of Distinguished Nature, stands for Gangster Disciples Nation, according to prison officials. While in prison in Colorado, in 2015, Hoover got in trouble for, gang activity, during a recorded phone conversation in which he discussed, gentlemen of distinguished nature, and said, the acronym for this clothing line is, GDN, the same acronym utilized by the Gangster Disciples Nation, according to a prison official's memo. They then discussed the clothing line, and, the issues that arose in their attempts to solidify the company. Hoover, uses personal stories of when he had a clothing line, ghetto prisoner, on the street, and, how he was able to turn a profit, the memo said. According to an article, published in the Chicago Sun-Times on March 11, 2022, companies linked to imprisoned gangster disciples Kingpin, Larry Hoover and his family, and supporters, are under federal scrutiny, according to records obtained by the Chicago Sun-Times. A federal grand jury, has subpoenaed the Illinois Secretary of State's Office for the Incorporation Records of 22 companies, including the Larry Hoover Project LLC, and the Larry Hoover Senior Legal Defense Fund, Limited. The subpoena, dated January 13, is part of an active investigation, a source told the Sun-Times. Federal prosecutors wouldn't comment on the case. No one, 
has been charged with any crime in connection with it. The grand jury was impaneled in 2020, the year Hoover began his quest for a sentencing break under the Federal First Step Act. Among other things, the law allows federal convicts to seek reductions in their sentences for selling crack cocaine, based on lower penalties enacted in 2010. Hoover's lawyer, Justin Moore, said he hasn't been contacted by federal authorities and doesn't know what the grand jury is looking into. Moore said, it would be surprising if Hoover, or his family members, are under investigation, saying he's isolated in prison, with his communications closely monitored, and Hoover's family members lead law-abiding lives. Hoover, 71, described by a federal judge last year as one of the most notorious criminals in Illinois history, is serving a life sentence at the federal Supermax prison in Colorado, convicted in 1997, of running a criminal enterprise in which authorities said, he oversaw a $100 million a year drug business, with tens of thousands of gang soldiers in Chicago, and other cities. After five decades in prison, the last 25 of them held in isolation, Moore said Hoover deserves to go free. Mr. Hoover deserves to be judged on who he is today, his lawyer said. I hope our justice system will allow him to return home to live out his final days with family. Linen Weber freed several of Hoover's former top associates, who also asked for new sentencing hearings under the First Step Act. They included Johnny Crusher Jackson, who was convicted in 2000 of narcotics conspiracy, after more than four years on the run. One of Jackson's companies, is named in the January 13th subpoena. Jackson, was once an assistant governor of the Gangster Disciples, controlling the drug market in Bronzeville, including the now demolished Robert Taylor Holmes public housing complex, sprawled along the Dan Ryan Expressway, according to prosecutors. Over prosecutors' objections, Jackson, was freed and placed on five years of supervised release, the federal justice system's term for probation. Then, he tried to get that supervised release ended early but, lost that effort, in a court filing, Prosecutors had told the judge, Jackson's continued connection to the GDs, is particularly troubling. Jackson, had a clothing line called Gentlemen of Distinguished Nature, whose acronym GDN, is the same as that of the, Gangster Disciples Nation, and whose website quotes Jackson saying, he served a prison term for a drug conspiracy involving father figure, Larry Hoover. And prosecutors said Jackson's wife, recently had sent Hoover $500 for prison commissary expenses, more than the $340 Jackson has paid toward his outstanding forfeiture judgment of $1 million. Linen Weber, denied Jackson's request to end his supervision early, but allowed him to travel for work within the continental United States. Over prosecutors' objections, Jackson was allowed to travel to Belize in late 2021, and early 2022, to meet his boss, James, J. Prince Price, a Houston music executive and promoter. In a court filing, Jackson's lawyer said the trip was to learn about, J. Prince's real estate business. The judge, denied Jackson's request to, transfer his parole supervision to Houston, to be closer to J. Prince, founder of rap -A Records, who's among those who, have rallied for Hoover's release. <laughs> Hallelujah. One nation.